Thank you for taking the time to listen to this message by Pastor Josh Cotts. We pray it blesses and encourages you throughout the week. If you'd like to know more about Living Word Church and the ministries associated with it, please visit our website at livingwordshawnee.org. Why don't you turn with me to Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13. I just want to read verse 15 for now. Hebrews 13, 15. It says, Through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. Most of us have heard this. If not all of us have heard this verse, we've read it. We've heard it repeated in church, especially as it uses an exhortation to, to call people to worship. Uh, but offering up a sacrifice of praise to God. And this has been on my heart really just for the last week because I feel like you're tired. Do you feel tired? I feel like everybody's tired. And uh, <clears throat> actually, the Lord brought me to the beautiful statement that Jesus makes whenever he calls the weary to come to him, the heavy laden to come to him. And uh, I, I almost did a message, a sermon, just on that and what that means, because whenever I teach or preach or whatever you want to call it, I always try to make sure that I'm discerning what it is that we need. Um, if my daughter needs food, I'm not going to not give her that. If she needs more vegetables, I'm not going to not give her more vegetables. So I think it's, it's our job, whoever's teaching up here, is to discern what it is that the body needs and to give them that. So <clears throat> I was thinking about that, and it's, it's perfectly okay to be tired. Um, it's something that happens to us. But being tired and praising God are not in the same realm. They don't coexist. Uh, praise is an all-the-time thing in every season and every weather every state of energy. Um, at the same time, I want you to know that if you are tired, Jesus can give you rest. And he wants to. But I want to talk about the sacrifice of praise today because there is something that happens whenever we praise God in the midst of trial, turmoil, difficulty, or tiredness. Some, there's something special and incredible that happens when we choose to praise him in the worst times possible. And that's specifically what I want to focus on today. So I want to start with this verse and just kind of talk a little bit about what it's saying here. It starts out by saying, through him. And if you read the whole chapter, uh, chapter 13, it's talking about Jesus. And a lot of what chapter 13 talks about is the difference between how sacrifices were made in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, and how sacrifices are made now, and the sacrifice of Jesus. So a lot of it is about Jesus. Um, and if you actually read, maybe your heading at the top of chapter 13 says the changeless Christ or the unchanging Christ, because this is really what this um, chapter is about. It's like a central focus on that. But verse 15 says, through him. Everybody say, through him. <clears throat> this is important. Through him, let us continually, everyone say continually. continually. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. It's interesting because the word through and the word continually are actually the same Greek word. No difference. Same exact Greek word. Through and continually. They have sort of different definitions, but they really do mean the same thing. 
Through, if you're be, going to be specific about it, the word through means throughout or during. So basically all the time because we're talking about Jesus. And the word continually means always. So they, they are the, the same word here. But it says through him, during him, throughout him, let us always offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. <clears throat> what this is literally saying is that our praise should be as constant as he is. Our praise should be as constant as he is. If he is continual, our praise should be continual. Our praise should continue as long as he continues. And how long is he going to continue? Forever. If you read in verse 8, if you want to pull it up there, you can. Verse 8 of chapter 13, it says, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. All right? He's not just the same yesterday and today. He's the same forever. If he's the same forever, it means he's going to last forever. All right? If, that's right. If Jesus lasts forever, if he is forever, then our praise should be forever. It should be as constant as he is. Okay, I want you to hold on to that. Did I say that, that our praise should be as constant as what he does? Our praise should be as constant as he is. To us, what God does will not always appear to be constant because he doesn't always do the same thing over and over and over and over, but he himself is everlasting. He's constant. Amen? <clears throat> so what this does is it gives a characteristic of continuity to Jesus, and it's actually one that we do not have right now. Um, he is much bigger, much longer lasting than we are. He is everlasting. He's been from before the beginning to after the end is where he will be. Um, but it, it ascribes a characteristic of continuity to him. And if he is continual and unwavering, then our praise should be as unwavering as he is. Amen? <clears throat> the difficulty with this is that whether we like it or not, we often allow our circumstances to measure our praise. We do. If we're going through a good time, it's really easy to praise God. If we're going through a hard time, it's really hard to praise God. We're human beings. I get it. God gets it. But praise doesn't care. It doesn't. Praise is not based on seasons. True praise. It's not based on seasons. It's not based on circumstance. It's not based on difficulty or ease. It's based on Him. Right? We just read that. As he is constant, so should our praise be. But what happens is we do allow our circumstances to dictate our praise. And whether you think that that's okay or not, I don't think it is okay, but we still do it. And I want you to know I have compassion for myself just as much as everybody in this room because we all do it. But like I said, praise does not care. God's glory does not care. God is always worthy, always, no matter what. And what happens to me does not change his worth, does not change his value. Amen? <clears throat> so it's really easy to praise God when everything is going right, when it seems like God is doing everything that we need him to do. It's, it's very easy to praise him when, everything, when the sun is up and there's no rain, figuratively speaking, everything is just happy and dandy. It's really easy to praise him during those times. But I don't know if we can call that praise because to me, a response to the good, a response to blessing, a response to favor, or a response to good times is thanksgiving more than it's praise because it's a response to something that has happened to you that you can thank God for, right? And we know there's a difference between thanksgiving and praise because the word says we enter into his gates with thanksgiving and we enter into his courts with praise. There's a difference between thanksgiving and praise. I think thanksgiving starts out, it, it starts out being inspired by something that God has done 
And that's why that's the first thing we do, because it's very easy to see when God is doing something, whenever he's working in our lives, it's very easy to see that, very easy to see that and begin our pursuit of him. I don't think there's anything wrong with Thanksgiving, but I, I don't know if we use it right. I think that Thanksgiving, we, we've kind of gotten ourselves into a trap with worship in that we thank God for what he does rather than thanking God for who he is. You see, when God does something for us, what really should happen is we should see the revelation of God that is in what he does. We shouldn't just see what he does, be like, thank you, God, for doing that. Instead, whatever he does, let it be a revelation of who he is and thank him for who he is. When you, when you transition your worship and praise life and your thanksgiving life to that, your praise will be constant. It will be constant. And you will always, rather than coming into his gates every Sunday morning, you will always remain in his gates um, or whenever something good happens to you. So, for instance, if, if God provides for us, rather than thanking him for what he provided, thank him that he is our provider. Thank you, God, for being my provider. Let God reveal himself to you in what he does. Let's not worship the works of God. Let's worship the God of the works. Amen? <clears throat> now, I, I feel like it's... Like I said, it's very easy to thank God. It's very easy to operate in thanksgiving. And, and oftentimes we do that here on Sunday mornings. It's oftentimes the first thing we do is we, we just give thanks to God. Um, the only problem is I don't know if we ever finish the journey, or I can't say ever. Sometimes we don't finish the journey and go ahead and enter into his courts with praise. It's like we got the thanksgiving down. It's very easy to do that. But whereas thanksgiving is inspired by something that God does, praise is just strictly and organically inspired by him, who he is. This is why praise takes us into his courts. And the courts are where he is. I think that if we could get over and look past, look beyond um, what God has done for us and how happy he makes us and how good our life is because of him. And instead, we could just gaze into his worth and into his beauty. We would be in his courts all the time. If we would allow the, the works of God to reveal to us the nature of God, then we would be in his courts all the time. And who wants, who, how many want to be in his courts all the time? Yeah, in his courts, the word says... Better is one day in his courts than a thousand days somewhere else. Like, how many of us, though, have spent even a thousand days in his courts? Like, that's, it's, it's actually a very difficult thing to do because as we're reading here, it's a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice. It's not an easy thing to do. Thanksgiving's pretty easy. Praise is not. It's not. And I want to talk about so, I want to get deeper into that, but man, I'm just moving right along here, you guys. We might be out of here in five minutes. I don't know. <laughs> well, that's not going to happen. Uh, <laughs> well, like I said, praising God despite what happens to us is, is not easy to do, and that's why the Word calls it a sacrifice, and I believe that praise is always a sacrifice. And I, I, I'll explain why. But if you read in verse 15 again, it says, Through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise. Everyone say sacrifice. sacrifice. This word sacrifice literally means a free gift. It's a gift that is free. It's a gift that is free, just like the favor of God, the salvation of God. It was free. I did not have to pay for it. All I had to do was ask for it. <laughs> All I had to do was receive Jesus, right? The sacrifice, it means a free gift. So what this is saying is let us continually offer up a free gift of praise to God. Now, the reason this is so important is because who is our sacrifice of praise free to? 
It's free to God. It's free to Him. In other words, He doesn't have to pay for it. Right? It's free. How many of you have gotten something free from a restaurant or something like that? You didn't have to pay for it. You just took it. That was it. The sacrifice of praise is free to God. He doesn't have to pay for it. How often do we make him pay for it? The thing about any gift that is given, though, is this. Anything that is given always costs somebody something. But if the sacrifice of praise costs God nothing, who has to pay for it? I do. I have to pay for it. I'm going to tell you something. Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus, bought your life, but he did not buy your praise. The sacrifice of Jesus bought me, but he did not buy my praise. Okay. Praise has to cost something. 2 Samuel 24, God talks to King David. You don't have to turn there. You can if you want. God talks to King David and says, I want you to go to the threshing floor of Arana, and I want you to build an altar on that threshing floor for me. So David goes to Arana. Arana bows down at David, David's feet. He says, King David, what are you doing here? David says, I'm here to buy your threshing floor because God told me to build an altar on it. And Arana says, please don't buy it. Please don't pay for it. You can have it. In fact, take the oxen too, use them as sacrifices, and then use the wood of their yokes for wood to burn the sacrifice. And David says, no, I'm going to pay for it because I can't offer to God something that costs me nothing. He says, I can't offer to God something that costs me nothing. How many times do you feel like we try to offer God something that costs us nothing? And I want to ask you kind of a hard question. Do you feel like that is reflective of the character and the nature of Jesus? Because everything we've been given through Jesus cost him everything. Now, he got it refunded, and he got folds upon folds more, but he gave it all, everything. He gave everything. It cost him everything, and that was the sacrifice of Jesus. But one thing, I want to I paint a picture for you. This is kind of like how I think that when we're facing difficulty, it's difficult to praise God. I think this is kind of how we tend to approach it. If you were to go to Chick-fil-A, which you can't today, that's why I'm talking about Chick-fil-A and not some other restaurant, sorry. Most anointed restaurant in all of uh, creation. Um, If you were to go to Chick-fil-A and you pulled into the drive-thru and they handed you a free chicken sandwich, this is most likely what you would do if you haven't done this before. Um, you'd probably take the chicken sandwich, the big smile on your face, surprised. You know, you'd have that surprise, like, I got it for free? That's so amazing. And then you'd be like, are you sure? Or something like that. Yeah, yeah, take it, it's free. And then you drove off. You'd probably be thinking, this is probably what we would do. God, thank you so much for blessing me today, giving me a free chicken sandwich. Thank you so much for doing that for me. There's nothing wrong with that, but what we might not think about is the fact that somebody had to pay for it. Chick-fil-A had to pay for that sandwich. No gift that is given is ever free. So if we try to offer to God something that costs us nothing, is that praise? Is that worship? When we offer God something that, basically what we would do is we would wait for God to show up and do something miraculous so that we can feel good about God. 
and feel good about life and be like, thank you, God, thank you so much. And then calamity comes. We get sick or something and we just mope and cry and we don't, we stop praising him. Like literally difficulty is here to increase the value of your worship. That is exactly what it does. Trials, I believe one of the purposes of trials is to increase the value of my worship. And yet I fail to, to, to take every opportunity during my trials and my difficulty to offer him something that actually cost me something. Amen? My praise to God should require no payment from him, just as his sacrifice required no payment from me, because praise, praise that requires payment is not sacrifice. Amen? And I believe that praise that requires payment, if praise that requires payment is not sacrifice, then praise that requires payment is not praise. Amen? If you think about it, if, if my praise is based on what God has done for me, then really my praise is based on me. Right? I'll leave that one there. I want to say this really quick. I don't want to dig too deep into this, but despite praise being a sacrifice, despite praise costing us something, it should never be done from a works mentality. A works mentality is mentality of a believer that still believes they can earn God through their works. Our praise should never be a performance for God. It should never be like, I'm, I, it should never be done out of poverty at all, in a poverty mentality. It should, be done, it should be done from a place of fullness, from a place of prosperity. God has filled me. Just as we were singing today, God began to show me something that maybe I'll bring up. I'm going to bring it up right now. Who cares? Um, we, we were singing at one point something about he never lets my well dry up. He never lets my well dry up. The word talks about out of the belly flowing rivers of living water. You know what Jesus says to the woman at the well? He says that he offers people living water. And when someone takes a drink of the living water, they'll never thirst again. And the word says that that living water is in our bellies. Right? Now, something I brought up before is that often in the, in the Old Testament, it refers to the voice of God as the sound of many waters. But then in Revelation, it refers to the voice of the saints as the sound of many waters. And it's almost like we are so filled with the living water of God that we actually become living water, that we actually become that. And I want to tell you something. If you are made in the image of God, in the image of Jesus, and Jesus is the word, then you are made to reflect the voice of God in the earth. You aren't the word of God, but you are made to reflect that image, to reflect that living water, the sound of many waters. And I want you to know, if you're ever in a dry season, you're not dry, you're just ignorant. <laughs> I didn't mean to say that, but you know, that's not in my notes. I didn't plan it. This is something I've said to myself before, something that God worked in me for so long is that it, it's actually not possible to go through a dry season when you have God because he is living water and he said you will never thirst again. If you are going through a dry season, you are ignorant of what God has put inside of you. That's what it is. And that's a totally separate message. But I can tell Pastor Cliff likes it, so maybe we'll do it again sometime. Right. <laughs> I want to tell you, though, praise should never be done from a works mentality, from a performance point of view, because I want to tell you this, you don't owe God anything. You don't owe him anything. Maybe you feel like you do, but that's works. You don't owe God anything. The reason you don't go owe God anything is because what he gave you was free. It requires no payment. The payment has been made right? So I don't owe God anything. So I should never praise him as though I owe him something, right? 
So my praise, if it's not coming from a place of owing God something, where does it have to come from? It doesn't come from a place of owing God. It comes from a place of knowing God. Amen? This is why praise takes us into his courts, the place where he is. Amen? Authentic praise can never be bought. I could pay you to tell me how great I am, and of course you would. I could pay you to tell me how great I am, and you would tell me how great I am because I paid you. Would it be inspired by how great I am, or would it be inspired by what I put in your pocket? That's what I'm saying. Praise, authentic praise, never requires payment of any kind. Sacrifice does not require payment. Amen? Amen. All right. Look at at verse 7 in chapter 13. We are actually finishing up, believe it or not. Thank you, Isaiah, for (laughs) affirming everyone's thoughts. (laughs) Look at verse 7 here. We don't know who the author of Hebrews is. Um, could have been Paul, could have been Barnabas. Uh, but he, basically the, the whole letter of Hebrews is written to Jewish Christians who were being pressured by the Jewish community to come back to Judaism. And they were feeling that pressure to go back to Judaism. And so this letter was written to Jewish Christians, people who were Jews, who, who converted to Christianity, to encourage them to s- stick it out. Stay in this. Don't, don't leave this. But this is what he says in verse 7. He says, Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. Imitate their faith. Now, this letter is talking about the people who taught them, but we know that Hebrews, when it comes to faith, Hebrews is the most popular book in the Bible when it comes to faith because of chapter 11, right? Right? Chapter 11 is the heroes of faith chapter. It goes through all of the, the, the different ones who took advantage of the faith that they had and used it to offer God worship in some way. If you read through chapter 11 about faith and all the heroes of faith, there's something that's in common between almost all of them. And it's that they all, almost all of them made some sort of sacrifice. And God counted it as faith. You know what I believe is the, was the greatest sacrifice of the Old Testament? I believe it's when Abraham carried Isaac up the mountain. Yes. Yeah. Now you're like, wait, he didn't sacrifice Isaac. Oh, yes, he did. In his mind, he did. He did. The moment he stepped into obedience and decided, I love God so much, and I I he is number one no matter what. I cannot imagine carrying Reagan up a mountain if God told me to do that. I cannot imagine doing that. The amount of torment that he probably went through that whole journey, and yet he continued on. Where his mind was at, he was making this sacrifice already without actually sacrificing Isaac. And it was all out of giving glory and worship to God. I will do anything for you, God. In any season, whatever you ask me, I will do it. And chapter 11 says, that's faith. Which do you think is faith? Praising God when it makes sense or praising him when it doesn't? That's faith. The sacrifice of praise is an expression of faith toward God. I trust you with whatever I'm going through. I trust you with my situation. I trust you with my family, my spouse, my children. And I'm just going to praise I'm going to glorify you. I'm going to give you worship right here in the midst of this. I trust you with my bank account. I trust you with my car and my house. And I'm just going to praise you right here in the midst of it. 
That's faith. Amen? There's one thing that I want to point out here. My last thought. Are you, have you gotten something today? Real, real quick, true faith is giving God praise when there is no natural cause for it. Look at verse 10. I'm going to read just a few verses here. It says, we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. I want to say something about this really quick because it sounds really weird. It sounds really weird. It says, we have an altar in which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. What this is addressing is priests, and you can read about this in Leviticus, the law was that priests could actually eat some of the sacrifice that was made. The purpose of sacrifices in the Old Testament, there are two purposes to sacrifices. One was for the forgiveness of sins. Two was for thanksgiving um, and worship to God. But the priest could actually eat some of the sacrifice uh, that was offered in the temple. And this is saying that we don't do it that way anymore, is what this is saying. That's the old covenant. But now it has all changed. And those who continue to operate under the old covenant and operate as though sac- it, it, the per- worship of God is done through the sacrifice, um, sacrifices of animals, those who continue to do that cannot partake, cannot partake of the new altar. The altar that it's talking about here, some people think it's talking about the cross. I, I don't think so. I think it's talking about Jesus. The cross was Jesus' altar. Jesus becomes our altar upon which we offer our praise. The sacrifice of praise. Are you with me? Okay. And then in verse 11, it says, For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as an offering for sin are burned outside the camp. The purpose of this, whenever sins were put onto an animal and it was sacrificed, after it was sacrificed, they would carry the dead animal outside of the camp. They were required to do it so as to keep the, the camp clean. And they would burn the animal, the sacrifice, outside of the camp. All right? And then in verse 12, it says, Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. In other words, he did not suffer in the walls of Jerusalem. He was taken out of the gate just as a sacrifice would have been taken out and destroyed outside of the gate. The area outside of the gate of the camp or outside of the camp was known as an unclean area. It was a place of disgrace and a place of shame because all of the, I mean, people were even stoned outside of the camp. All right, it was a place of shame, disgrace, unclean place. And this is where Jesus was taken, all right? In the same way that it was done in the Old Covenant. And then in verse 13, it says, So let us go to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. There is a call. Now, now I believe that this is calling Jewish Christians to completely depart from the Jewish faith and to come wholly into Christianity. But one thing that we have to understand is that we are not supposed to live inside the camp. We are supposed to be living outside the camp in the area of reproach, in the area of disgrace. Now, this sounds really terrible, doesn't it? Who wants to live in that place? This says this is what we're called to. We're called to the place of of reproach with Jesus. Just as Amriel actually referenced, bearing those same reproaches, bearing that same uh, persecution that Jesus faced. And then it says, through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that confess his name. Where do you think that sacrifice is being made? In the most difficult place possible. 
It's not made within the bounds and the comfort of the camp. It's made outside where there's reproach and there's persecution and it's undignified. Just as David, I believe, when he danced before the Lord with all his might, he was dancing way outside the camp. And that's why his wife looked down on him with shame. He was dancing outside the camp. He was like, I'm, I'm willing to bear all of this because I want to give God what he's worth. I want to give God something that he deserves. I want to give him everything no matter what I'm going through. We are actually called to this place, but what's so incredible is that when we offer up this sacrifice of praise, something happens. In the Old Testament, in one of the Psalms, it says, out of the, out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have ordained strength. It says in Psalm, you have ordained strength, but then Jesus quotes it in the Gospels, and he says, you have ordained praise. So it sounds like Jesus is misquoting the Bible. But he's not. The word strength in the, in the psalm that has this verse, I know I'm going a lot longer than I said I was going to, Isaiah, but that's just what happens, you know? The word strength in, in the psalm means stronghold. It means a stronghold. You know what a stronghold is? It's a place of protection. It's a place of safety. It's a wall. It's a guard. It's a bulwark. That's what a stronghold is. And Jesus, when he quotes that verse, he says, praise. Why do you think that is? I can't think of any other reason than the fact that praise actually becomes our stronghold in the midst of a place where there is none. It creates a place of safety for us. It creates a strong wall, a bulwark for us to be able to fight from. Because we are not called to live within the bounds of the city, of the camp, in the comfort, in, in the place where even old traditions and things are. We're called to the place outside where Jesus went. It says, let us go out to him now and then offer unto him a sacrifice of praise. And I promise you, you will see this happen. If you are facing difficulty, trial, turmoil, sickness, loss, sorrow, anger, sadness, whatever it is, if you're facing those things and you begin to give praise to God, you will feel the safest you've ever felt. You will experience the safety of God right there in that moment. You will. Because that's what it does. It establishes a stronghold in your life, and that stronghold is God-glorified. Glorify, magnify means to make bigger, means to make larger, magnify. If you're going to magnify God, why wouldn't you do it in a time where he looks really small? That's the best time to make him bigger, giving him that glory. Amen? Why don't you stand with me? Thank you for taking the time to listen to this message by Pastor Josh Kotz. We pray it blesses and encourages you throughout the week. If you'd like to know more about Living Word Church and the ministries associated with it, please visit our website at livingwordshawnee.org.